So um, can everyone, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Perfect. Yes. Are you, are you going to introduce yourself? Yes, I, I am. Um, so my name is Dana Peak, and I'm the uh, principal planner um, and historic preservation officer for the city. Um, we're here to talk about the San Jose Eichler Neighborhood Objective Design Standards. Um, we have one member <laughs> in the audience, Ben from PACSJ, um, and yourself. Um, let me just sort of uh, give you an outline. This meeting is really uh, to give you the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, it's hard with community meetings to know what, what everyone's um, background is on having read the documents. So I'm going to give just sort of a, a brief um, overview of it. And the remainder will just be for you to provide any feedback that you want to provide. Um, this is, I've provided you all to panelists, um, at least the people that I've seen so far. So if, if you have any questions, please feel free to speak up. This is not a formal uh, meeting. It was meant to be a you know, more in-person conversation. So those on, feel free to, to just stop me if you have a question. So um, I'm just going to do a little bit on project background and then generally what objective design standards are. Uh, just a general overview on the different sections of the document, and then we'll have time for your community input and just what the next steps are. So again, my name is Dana Peak. I'm the city's historic preservation officer. Um, I'm not sure whether most of you are from the Fair Glen Additions neighborhood. Um, if you are, you'll, you'll already be familiar with the, the background. Hi. Are you here for the Eichler? Perfect. We're just starting the meeting. <laughs> Everybody else is online, so. <laughs> um, so as you know, um, not this project, but in general, this um, these concepts were initiated in 2016 um, when a group of Fair Glen Edition residents formed the Fair Glen Preservation Committee um, to try to get the neighborhood listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so in 2018, that's when Sally prepared the uh, National Register Multiple Properties documentation um, for the housing tracts of Joseph Eichler in San Jose, California, 52 to 93. Um, that was a wonderful um, nomination because it provides all the documentation to allow other Eichler neighborhoods uh, in San Jose to um, also list their their neighborhoods on the National Register by providing the credit. So that was such a great document to have and such a gift um, to, to the rest of the um, so in 2019 the Fair Glen Editions neighborhood was listed on the National Register. And following that, um, the idea was developed to draft some design guidelines for how to maintain, repair, and modify Eichler houses, and then how to treat new construction in the district so that the distinctive characteristics of the neighborhood. Um, that group used um, the design guidelines for Eichler houses from the city of Orange, Palo Alto, and Sunnyvale as references. Um, so that was um, provided to the city in and in a real interest from the preservation committee to, to um, get the guidelines published and adopted by the city council. So in 2024, the city hired Paige and Trimble to review that draft design guidelines that was prepared by the preservation committee and convert them into objective design standards and also to convert them to uh, more Eichler citywide um, guidelines rather than specific to the Fair Glen edition. Excuse me, Dana. 
Yes. Um, is there something you can do to improve the quality of your audio? It it cuts out now and then, and I miss a word here and there. It's it hasn't been a problem yet, but I think when you get into the more substantive part of your presentation, there there might be there might be issues with understanding what you're saying. Okay. It, does this help? Don't know yet because you haven't said more than a couple words. <laughs> okay. Well, just keep um, let me know. There's not much I can do because I'm in a room that is um, coordinated by the AV department. So okay. there's not a lot I can do about that, but I will try to speak directly into the microphone for you. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it was a wireless issue or I, I don't, I'm not a tech person, but sure. Thank you. I always find when we're in the Historic Landmarks Commission meeting that if people don't speak directly into the microphone, you can't hear it on Zoom. So I will do my best. Um, so again, the objective um, of hiring Paige and Trimble was to uh, turn the design guidelines into design standards um, that were objective and to also make them applicable to the other five um, Eichler neighborhoods in San Jose sh should those um, neighborhoods be designated. So the draft Eichler neighborhood objective design standards are now out for review. And just uh, take a moment to talk about objective design standards. Um, these really came into play when a lot of the new housing laws that the state was implementing um, came into fruition. Um, it's intended to make design requirements easier to interpret and more predictable for everyone involved in a project. Um, they're really um, primarily by law uh, required for new housing uh, development projects, um, not necessarily for existing, um, but there will be instances where new construction, you know, could potentially occur uh, in the neighborhood. And so we can only apply object design standards. Um, so it will be necessary for those types of projects as well. Um, so if we don't have any objective design standards, we have, we don't have very much control over the look of things in our community. So that's the reason to ensure that projects continue to fit in with our, with the city's vision. Um, that it has for the community. Um, so ob objective design, oh, sorry. Um, so what's the difference between guidelines and standards? So guidelines, there, um, there is discretion that's applied or leeway and in interpretation. Uh, and standards are more measurable and verifiable. Um, and they use language like shall or must. So there's an example on the slide um, where it says a design guideline might be provide articulation to reduce the apparent mass and scale of the building and to be sensitive to the neighborhood. So you can see that that provides a little bit of um, interpretation about how uh, different people might um, you know, uh, define mass and scale and what would be sensitive. So an objective design standard would be at intervals of at least 100 feet of building length, there shall be a plane break along the facade composed of an offset of at least five feet in depth by 25 feet in length. The offset shall extend from grade to the highest story. So the drawback about design standards as you know, I'm, I'm sure as you provide comments uh, later on in the meeting is that we have to sort of anticipate what that design standard is going to look like when it's applied. So because there's no leeway there and you have to follow it, um, it's going to be what it's going to be. So um, we, we have to be careful about, um, you know, the, the kinds of things that we're um, saying must and shall. Um, so this is just an outline of the document. It's divided into nine chapters. Um, chapter one is basically, um, well, the document is to, um, 
to provide design requirements. And again, it's the shall and the must, which are the standards. There's also sections in the document that's voluntary guidelines, um, guidance, which would be the guidelines. Um, and these are specific to Eichler houses um, and it's for property owners and design professionals and city staff when you're planning and reviewing projects for exterior modifications or new constructions to homes in Eichler neighborhoods. Um, the guidelines only apply when homeowners propose to propose a project requiring a planning permit. And they only apply to properties listed in the San Jose Historic Resources Inventory. So right now, that's just the um, Fair Glen additions. It only applies to exterior changes, and it doesn't cover changes to the interior. And the guidelines would be applied as part of the single family house process, which is our process for changes to properties that are listed in the inventory, houses mainly. Um, they supplement the year old house guidelines, which are pictured um, on the right. The year old house guidelines, if anybody has used them or is familiar with them, they're primarily uh, for uh, the styles that are covered in them are mainly pre-World War II houses. So you have a lot of revival styles, Victorian styles, um, bungalows, which are very, very different from Eichler houses, which are post-World War II and very modern. So the idea is to provide a, a, a new set of guidelines that would supplement these that are particular to the design uh, character and features of Eichler houses. Uh, as I said before, there's five neighborhoods that are um, Eichlers in um, Eichler neighborhoods in San Jose. Um, only one is designated and that's the Fair Glen additions. Um, but if a neighborhood came forth and they wanted to designate their neighborhood in the future, then these guidelines would, would apply if, if they were designated and listed on the historic resources inventory. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Um, the guidelines, the standards are based on the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. Um, and there are associated guidelines um, for preserving, rehabilitating, and restoring and constructing historic buildings. Um, and these are all concepts about maintaining, repairing, and replacing historic materials and also designing new additions and making alterations to historic buildings. They're um, written in a way that provide general design and technical recommendations. Um, and the uh, design standards um, for the Eichler project are written to be consistent with these standards and guidelines. Uh, chapter two um, talks about um, guiding principles and key concepts. So when we apply uh, standards and guidelines, we look at the specific houses. Um, when the National Register nomination was done, uh, properties were uh, looked at individually and they were determined whether they contributed or didn't contribute to the character of the neighborhood. Um, so the, the chapter talks about how each of those contributing or non-contributing properties would be treated. Um, the public realm versus the private realm. So there's um, guidelines about um, the public realm in terms of the, the street um, and the setting. It talks about uh, what the primary and secondary features of character are for Eichler homes and also provides definitions. So in order to determine what would um, be compatible with the character of an Eichler house, we have to look at what the character defining features are. So there's a couple of illustrations in the uh, document that talk about what the primary original features were, and it points them out in a diagram, and then what the secondary features are. And those are the features that we're going to want to um, maintain um, in order to, to uh, preserve the character. Um, the third chapter goes through the history and characteristics of the neighborhood. 
um, it's there's interesting information on the Eichler neighborhoods um, that came from the National Register nomination and the various features, um, general uh, characteristics and features that make them um, significant. Um, chapter four um, is really kind of the, the meat of it. Um, these are the standards for um, for projects and uh, the chapter is divided into different sections. One talks about roofs, um, the other about exterior cladding and what's appropriate um, for changes to that, how to treat carports, um, garages and exterior doors, windows, mechanical and security. Um, so one example um, that's in the the guidelines just talks about exterior cladding materials and what's important. And again, these are these are written as shells and musts, and then it gives examples as to uh, what we're looking for and what to avoid. Um, chapter five talks about standards for additions um, and accessory structures. Um, the examples that are provided um, give sort of a visual example of um, compatible additions and some um, second story additions um, that should be avoided. Chapter six talks about setting and landscape. As I said, um, it goes over uh, things that are character defining for the front yards, the walkways, driveways, paved services, fences, and exterior cladding. Again, examples about um, the driveway and walkways and what we're looking for and what should be avoided. And chapter seven talks about how to treat non-contributing buildings. And it goes to the same format um, as the as chapter four, which is it looks at the setting and the roof forms and the cladding materials and how to, to treat uh, non-contributing buildings with additions. Chapter eight is exclusively devoted to infill or new construction. So again, it just talks about height, massing, and some general examples. And chapter nine um, deals with uh, ADUs. So this is a guidelines chapter because we don't review, um, single family house permits are not required for ADUs. So it gives some general guidelines and design advice for people, um, but they're not required. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for the moment. Um, let's see. So at this point, oh, I see Kathy, you have your hand up. Again, this, it's hard because everyone, most people are online. Um, so I don't know what people's familiarity are with the guidelines. Uh, we're really here to um, take comments based on the text that's in the, um, in the document. So um, I see a couple hands up and we'll just, we'll just um, get started. I think I'm gonna start with, um, people online first, if that's okay. And I'm also, there's nine attendees. I'm gonna put you in the panelist section if I can. Um, so that you'll be able to talk. And I'm sorry, I'm only one person trying to run this. So it's a little bit complicated with online and... <laughs> So those who are attendees that are not panelists yet, I'm I'm promoting you to panelists, and you'll need to accept that um, it's something will pop up on your screen. Um, those that are calling in, I I'm not able to make you a panelist. You don't need to accept it if you don't want to, but if you do, please push accept panelist.
Okay, there's quite a few people that aren't accepting, so I'm going to just go on to, to those that have their hands up. All right, um, let me just get a pen to suck it. All right, Kathy, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, originally, my hand was up just to call to your attention the fact that I wasn't able to hear you clearly, but um, I do have a few questions uh, or comments as well. Um, and I'm just wondering where to start. I guess a, a really simple one that occurs to me uh, way back uh, toward toward the end where you're talking about landscaping in these um, standards, um, as I understand it, none of these rules would apply at all unless a permit was being sought. Um, and that's not normally required for landscaping unless you're, you know, moving a certain amount of dirt or putting in electricity or changing plumbing or you know, building a retaining wall or something. So I'm curious to know why there is um, a statement about what what should be planted in the parkway, specifically low low growing uh, plantings up to two feet high. You know that type of thing. Sure. I mean, you have you have a good point. We can only really review you know, what is, what somebody's applying for a permit for. Um, we do do conformance review um, for building permits. So if something came through like a retaining wall, you know, we would potentially look at that. Um, but, you know, if you're planting your landscaping in front, you know, you're not going to be, that's not going to require a permit that can be reviewed by the city. So I'm just going to note that. Um, yeah. Well, I guess I'm I'm wondering, I, I'm sure you, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to comply with these rules, whatever they are. And also at the same time, you want to make it as, as uh, you want to encourage people to apply for permits when they're required. And you don't want to set anybody up for a situation where people say, well, gee, if I apply for a permit, are they going to make me, you know, are they going to have some comments about what's planted in my parkway on their way up to the front door to look at, you know, what, what I'm applying for, an, for a permit on, or is the inspector while he's here going to, you know, be commenting on, gee, there's a, there's a, there's a little berm here in your landscaping, which could be part of a water garden, you know, for that matter these days. Sir. Sure. So, yeah, you know, that type of thing, so. And just to clarify, normally what we do um, is when we receive, the city receives a draft document, we will make comments on it and it will go back to the consultant and then it will go out to the public. That mm -hmm. wasn't the case for this project because we didn't have the funds to do that. So what you're seeing right now is the draft that I'm seeing for the first time. So there haven't been any city comments made on it yet. And that's why I'm saying, you know, that's a good point um, because these are all things that we would be saying too. Um, okay. they, they are outlined as objective design standards. So I think that's something to, you know, point out and discuss with them. Maybe some are standards and some are guidelines. Okay. And, and um, I, I noticed a couple of typographical errors that seem to affect the meaning. There are some others that don't really, I'm sure anybody would catch as they were reading through, but I wanted to make sure that I was reading them correctly. Um, and I'll, I'll have to dig through my notes and I'll put my hand back up in a minute, sure. maybe go on to others and I'll, I'll find the pages where those occurred that I wanted to ask about. Um, also, these are gonna be open for review through November 8th. So if you would like to make notes and, and email them to me at the end, I'll, I'll provide information about where comments and how comments can be made. 
um, this is a kind of, and that's probably more nitty gritty, you know, into the weeds, what you're talking about. We do, yeah. we do want to get in the weeds to talk about, you know, what do we think about second story additions in terms of shall invest and these types of concepts. Mm -hmm. But if there's um, typographical errors or word choice errors or something that might be good to email. Okay. Okay. Daniel. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say, I think the document is generally excellent and thank you to everybody who put work in. I know Sally started it. I live in Fairhaven, um, and so we're not historically um, certified yet, but we're considering doing it. Um, and I have a couple of technical points on the document, and you started it. Second story, um, our uh, community of the Eichlers feels very strongly that second story should not be allowed. And so I'm in, and both for houses and for ADUs. So that would be section 5.1.2 and section 9.1.6. So I'd like to maybe hear from you, Dana, or the architects as to why you left it in, what's your reasoning for allowing second stories in neighborhoods that never have any. Sure. I think uh, the reason really was flexibility. Um, you know, uh, Properties are very, very expensive in the Silicon Valley. Um, families' needs have changed and are growing. Um, so the idea was to allow people the opportunity to expand their homes um, in a way that, you know, it, it might be sensitive. Um, but again, you know, this is something to... To discuss and this is where it gets difficult about the you know the shells and the All right the maze um but it is something that we will need to make a decision on um so, so yeah i would um like to speak for fairhaven because we have actually codified in our updated ccrs that second stories are not allowed um that we would recommend to not allow it in the objective design standard. And I am on our the Fairhaven Architectural Review Committee because we do have our own process in our bylaws and CCNRs. Um, so that would kind of be our, our input on that topic. Um, and uh, I understand the flexibility, but um, you can build out the back side of the house um, as a way to grow the square footage. Okay. Yep. Then the next point, I have two more points. Um, one in the document. Uh, on fences and front yards, section 6.3.1, um, the objective standard allows fences and front yards to box in the front yard. And that is very much not um, an Eichler kind of um, landscape kind of thing. And so I'm wondering again, my question, what was the reason, um, you know, for, for doing that? Oh, sorry. I, I thought you were going to go on. Um, no. yeah. So basically the direction that we gave to the consultant was to provide some flexibility. So that's what they've, that's what they've done. And then the mm -hmm. idea was we would give them feedback, you know, is this too far, mm -hmm. but you know, Again, um, given the fact that this is a an objective standard, um, we're trying to provide some flexibility. So I totally I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. and it's just something I think you know we'll have to talk about with the consultant and also see what they think. Um, right. You know they they are qualified historic resources consultant consultants. They have done other Eichler mm -hmm. and guidelines, so they are very familiar with it. Um, and it's really just. How, how strict the community wants to be. And, you know, these, these right now only apply to one neighborhood. They could apply to uh -huh. your neighborhood, you know, if you were to designate. Yeah. Get the, so uh, it's hard because, you know, this is something that has to apply to the city of San Jose. Um, uh -huh. And the city of San Jose can't enforce these CNRs. So, um, it, it, we would just have to figure out maybe where the middle ground is. Right. So I guess I would like to just be on record as recommending 
from well, not just myself, but on behalf of Fairhaven, that we would prefer the recommendations to be no second stories and no front yard fences. So that changes the three sections that I mentioned. Okay. And then I have one last thing. Don't mean to take everybody's time. But as I mentioned, since CC, since Fairhaven has redone its CCNRs, and in its CCNRs, there are specifics on some of these points. What is the relationship and precedence between our CCRs and the objective design standard? Well, like I said, the city cannot legally enforce CCNRs. So that would be, you know, be between you and... And, right, but here's here's yeah. the dilemma that I think we face because Fairhaven is in the process of pursuing historic preservation status. But if we did that, and now there's two documents in force, right? And we would need to know which one has precedence because if ours are stricter in some place, then could somebody say, well, I'm following the objective standard and therefore I don't have to follow the CCNR, whereas the CCNR, since it's bound to the title, um, the actual binding document in the cases where it's stricter. And maybe this is a question for a lawyer and you can- Yeah, we can talk to our um, CAO's office about that. So yeah, could I make that request? We have our own real estate attorney, but having multiple opinions sure. would be a good idea. So if we could get a, an official statement of whether the CCNRs trump the objective guidelines if you have historic status or vice versa. Okay. Thank you. And that's it. Great. Um, Chris Mays? Hi, yeah. I have a couple questions. Um, maybe the first question is just, could you, and you explain this a little bit, but can you just explain the process um, kind of going forward from here, uh, I'm sort of interested in, so you said, I think that there's a general review um, until November. And then I guess the second question is sort of related to that process. Like, um, you know, we're talking about a neighborhood here, the Fairland Additions, which is a fairly small, I don't know how many, 300 maybe houses, maybe less. Um, is there a notion that it would have to be ratified or is it just like because we've decided to have historic um, status whatever happens you know after this comment period gets gets chosen and and these design standards then become uh yeah approved um so there'll be i'm just going on to um the next couple of slides the next so the next steps are we have this community meeting um, the Historic Landmarks Commission will also be reviewing the standards um, at their regular meeting on November 6. And then eventually the city council will need to um, adopt the um, standards in order to be used. Um, so those are all opportunities for comment. But what will happen is uh, the comments will all be um, gathered by city staff um, and then we'll have to, and it's, this is internal comments, this is community public comments and the Historic Landmarks Commission. And then we're going to have to work with a consultant to finalize the document and we're going to have to make some decisions. Um, and then, you know, there'll be public comment at the city council uh, meeting as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's very helpful. <laughs> Um, let's see. All right. So Kevin and Sandy. Hi. Hi um, so I just wanted to go back to the proposal regarding um, second stories being allowed. Um, this is just my personal opinion, but I do want to express it as well. Um, my concern with that is privacy. So, you know, our all of our backyards, everyone has floor to ceiling windows in the back. And if we had second story, people had second stories, we would have to install, you know, um, some sort blinds of screen or, or whatever. Yeah. And that defeats the purpose of having an Eichler, in my opinion. So 
I wouldn't prefer to have, like, I know I do understand that people need flexibility and blah, blah, blah. But our um, architect, you know, the type of arch architecture of our, for our house is very, um, it's non-conventional. So it, I don't, I'm not sure um, I, if I would feel comfortable having a neighbor do a second story um, because I do like leaving the blinds open in my own backyard and having that privacy, but being able to also open, um, you know, have the back open and not having it covered. So I just wanted to um, put my opinion on second stories there, but I, yeah. Have you had a chance to review that section? Uh, we have not, um, but we will be looking, reviewing it more carefully um, soon. Great. I would just, um, and it's not set in stone by any means, um, but I would suggest looking at it for sure and seeing how they think a second story can be achieved and whether, you know, you think that's compatible um, because by concept, it, it may be more like, oh my gosh, that would be, you know, really out of character. Um, but, you know, if you look at, take a look at the examples and what the actual standards are and see, see whether, whether you still think the same thing, you may or may not, but um, I, I would definitely take a look at the text and the, the photos. Okay. We'll, we'll be doing that for sure. Wait, what? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Nabila. Yeah, hi. Um, my wife and I would just want to uh, echo the same concerns about privacy with the second story. We we also need to review the um, the full text of the document. But um, like for example, our neighbor is maybe five feet away from our fence line, and if they put any sort of second story up, I I don't see how they wouldn't be able to see right into our back, um, our entire back uh, line of our house. Um, so we just wanted to to add our, our two cents to that. Great. I've got you down. Thank you. All right, Jay. Hi. Um, yeah, I also wanted to congratulate staff on, and, and the architect on this plan. I think it's excellent in many, many ways. Uh, but I also wanted to, um, uh, I know we've said, I'm the, probably the third person that said this, uh, think more about second floor, second story additions, uh, particularly with the recommendation that these um, uh, additions be pushed toward the back of the property. That's exactly what would be the problem that I think other people are talking about. All of the backs of our buildings are just solid walls of glass. Um, and as you have a second floor neighbor, um, they'd be just looking right in on you. Um, it's something unique to Eichler's, but that combined with the fact that you're recommending pushing the second floor additions when allowed to the back of property. Uh, the other comment I had was um, there, I did just skim through the, the recommendation, the, uh, the design standards, and it was, um, I just, I was concerned over the requirement that any solar panels uh, have a very minimal um, um, uh, uh, exposure from the street. I understand we want to minimize that, but at the same time, panels may require certain orientations in order to maximize um, uh, their, their efficiency, and I think that given the fact that we, we want to be a historic neighborhood, but we also want to be, um, to uh, try to be as green a neighborhood as we can and to be energy independent. I think that needs to be looked at. Um, I think that the priority should be toward, toward um, the solar panel and not its visibility. Uh, and then the, the third item I wanted to ask about was, I don't remember seeing in the report any discussion of of electrical light fixtures in terms of design standards. Do you know if that's included in this or not? Or did I just miss it? I don't remember. So I think we'll have to go back and look, but I am making a note of it. But there are very prominent design elements that, um, that it would be important, much like front doors, uh, that, you know, that it's important that they have um, 
you know, a modern look rather okay. than, you know, um, something more traditional in appearance. And that's all I have to say. Great. Um, I just wanted to point out that the solar panel section, which is part of the ADUs, I think, and accessory structure section is, um, it's guidelines rather than objective design standards. So it's just, it's just giving advice on sort of, you know, oh, okay. the, the desire to have a minimal profile, but it's not required. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Peter. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Hurd, and um, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I am the co-chair with Sally Zarnowitz in creating this design criteria that we went began working on six years ago uh, and getting the neighborhood together to determine once and for all that we had some sort of documentation that protected basically, quote, the architectural integrity of the Eichler design in an Eichler neighborhood. It's obvious to most of us that when you enter uh, an Eichler neighborhood, it looks like an Eichler neighborhood, and it's defined by many of those attributes that we're talking about. Um, so that was our premise, and we had a committee of various people in the neighborhood who went out of their way and did an incredible job over four years or more to help us through many, many weeks and months of planning, knocking on doors and going through all of these things to get a, try and get it as right as we can and respect the homeowners uh, as well, of course, who lived in the homes and their investments. Um, so to that degree, that's how we got where we are. I wanted to mention something that we talked about greatly, which is the second story additions. By and large, we were not for them at all. They are not an original Eichler concept, more or less. And we did not prefer to see them for many of the reasons that you all are addressing. However, in an effort to be accommodating and not scare away potential owners or buyers from doing what they wanted to do with their investment up to a point we recommended design a design review that would minimize what a second story could be like and how big it could be. And that either had to do with like the positioning of the second story and most importantly, the roof line and how much of it there was. So that's why we left it a little ambiguous because we didn't want to turn people off and say, we don't like what's going on, whereas the majority of all of us and most of the people I'm hearing tonight don't want a second story on an Eichler because it was not indicative of what an Eichler was. So there was consideration for it, but we did compromise by saying, let's help the design review people can put conditions on it that make it more acceptable and less intrusive in the architectural community as we see in Eichler. So that's how that got there. Any, Thank you. any questions? <laughs> Very helpful. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Did you have anything else to add, Peter? Or? Well, just, just that uh, I think that the city's done a wonderful job in putting this together. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Sacramento and Sally has done an incredible job with her talents of putting together these documentations. Um, I was involved in the organization of the process and she was the guru of the architectural uh, specialties. And we all worked together, uh, Bill Fanall, Jerry, uh, very many of us were involved in the neighborhood putting these things together. together uh, uh, and had many meetings. So uh, there was a lot of thought put into it. And so we're very happy to be at this place today with the city and the fact that they have put this together and um, that we're here discussing this and making it something that we can live with um, and compromise with as we need to. But again, I want to say the main ingredient of this whole thing is to absolutely 
protect the architectural integrity of what an Eichler neighborhood looks like, period. From the outside, we don't care what people do inside. That's where they live. It's their home. I like the, I like the uh, suggestion, if it meets code, to extend out the back of the house instead of going up, things like that. And I'm very sensitive, and I think we all are, especially that was mentioned often to people having second stories that could look in people's backyards with all the glass backyards. I think that's a very valid point. It robs all the other people of their privacy and their investment. So I think it's a very um, sensitive subject. And that's why we didn't really like it. But we hope that you all can find a way to mitigate any problems that 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 may chance to want to develop through some approval of some variation of it. So Daniel, meet Peter and Sally. I don't know if you know them, but um, you know they were very prominent in the efforts for both the guidelines and the National Register nomination. So they're they're great contacts. Yes, I definitely met Sally, and she was a great help in bootstrapping our. Uh, work to get on the historic preservation um, list. Great. Uh, Emma? Hi there. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Um, I know we're like beating a dead horse here with the second stories. I just wanted to propose a potential alternate solution, and I'm not sure how this works with um, the existing permit process or the city, but I just can't help but wondering about neighbor approval for some of those kinds of projects. Like I completely understand the wanting to be flexible. Um, I also found it kind of like, I don't know if I would use the word hypocritical, but for lack of a better word, like the garage can't be turned into living space yet you can add a second story. Like some of these things it's like, okay, uh, you can expand, but only in these ways. And that seems a little bit restrictive to me. Um, so I wonder about, as part of the permit process, can the four neighbors surrounding you, you know, have any have weigh in on that at all? Um, that was one thought. Maybe that is not possible, not realistic, but um, it was a thought there because I think, to me, um, I think that there are second stories in our neighborhood that already exist that have been tastefully done. Like it's not a problem. Like I, I actually find a lot of these guidelines too restrictive for homeowners. I think. The concern comes for some people, maybe it comes from the historical integrity. For a lot of people, they're just like, I don't want someone looking at me naked walking through my house because that's what we all do. We don't have front windows. We only have back windows. Covering up those windows is like a, a major problem. It's like we all have had the experience of waking up and having your gardener see you naked because that's what it means to live in Eichler House. We don't also want our neighbors seeing that, right? Um I think that's that's where people are coming from with that. I know this has been talked about a lot, but I think if we are thoughtful about how that's implemented in terms of can these neighbors be asked as part of the permit process or can there be very specific guidelines of viewpoints? Like I know in architecture, you can say like, well, it can be this high up and you can have a view at this angle. Those kinds of things I would wanna see much more clearly because I think that addresses the privacy issue much more than here, where it's like sort of ambiguous. Maybe you can do it. It's discouraged. Um, yeah, so that was that was one thought there. And um, in general, I found like the landscaping stuff, similar to Kathy, also to be very restrictive and also hard to implement or or sort of like keep track of. And, and I agreed with her also that not just that, but I worry about people just doing things unpermitted because they're so worried by being sh like struck by all of these standards. Um, same with like the solar panels, like green energy is so important. And people are like, well, I don't even want to put solar panels in because the city's going to nick me for, you know, all of that. Um, not to mention it takes a long time to get these permits approved and everything. So I did want to echo that, that I have that same concern with some of this. Um, I think generally having historical guideline standards is wonderful. I just, and of course, this is why we're having this meeting, want to be very deliberate about how they are implemented to make sure that um, people feel encouraged to comply and not deterred from it. Um, that's all. 
Uh, thanks, Emma. I just wanted to see what others thought about, she mentioned uh, the second story versus not being able to enclose garages for living space. And I just wanted to, to see if others had any thoughts about that or some things being too restrictive or some not enough. D does anyone have any thoughts? There is a difference between permitting and guidelines. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say that. No. After All right, um, Sally? Hi, um, thank you, uh, Dana, for all the work on this. Thanks to the city and to Paige and Turnbull. Um, and um, just kind of recognizing that it is the city's document and the city will be, you know, using it. I, um, I think uh, one of the main things on the second story would be a question about the zoning because, uh, you know, the zoning allows two stories. So would it actually be, could the design guidelines actually prohibit that? So I assume that's something uh, that would be looked into because, um, you know, that's kind of our general understanding is the zoning, you know, has setbacks and height and and a number of stories. And unless we had without like a single story overlay or a planned development zoning that restricted that, you know, could that be enforced with the guidelines? I guess that's a question that maybe is opening tonight. I'm not sure. I, I think also the living space is allowed with an ADU or a JD, JADU, right? So, and I think the document's pretty clear about that, that you can convert the garage to a junior ADU by state law, basically, right? Um, and uh, I felt like it covered some of that. Also, the um, some of the skylight, uh, sorry, the um, solar panels, it was clear that, you know, those are allowed, but these are, like you said, uh, Dana, I think you said that, that they're, mm -hmm. you no, know, not standards, but guidelines. Um, so anyhow, I don't know if that, just just some of my react, my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, just to clarify too, like Sally was saying, um, gosh, I can't even remember when it was, but it's the solar stuff is state law too. So we can't, you know, prohibit solar on, on houses. Um, okay, I we have actually people in the audience here in the room, so um, I'm going to go to um, their comments. Just one minute. Uh, well, hello, my name is Daniel, and I'm a designer. I'm a home designer in the San Jose area, in the, in the Silicon Valley, and I'm coming as a service provider to some of the homeowners and some of the people that are working with these homes and uh, construction. And my question, I guess, is just understand a little bit about what the benefits are when a neighborhood turns into, becomes part of the registry, just to see, you know, why it's encouraged and why not. And then... A little bit about the technical questions is like, how well are you guys contemplating the integration with all the new and high energy or energy efficiency uh, requirements and equipment that is not available for people? These are very difficult houses to work with. Uh, there's not enough space to run lines and docks and systems. So what, what, what is the city doing to accommodate for these upgrades that are now very, are happening and how to not discourage people from getting permits? Um, and then also a little bit about, um, well, just touching on like the sustainability. I you know we, we had, I had a case, uh, you know, working on a historical home where it, it was just really difficult to understand what the guidelines or what the requirements are and how, 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 you know, energy efficiency products really fit the criteria of some of these historical homes that do very poorly due to just barely, you know, not being designed to perform like homes are designed to perform now. Uh, just kind of like, you know, what are you guys doing to integrate also with building, uh, with the other departments, with environmental, you know, to, to really make a, a, a design guideline that not only encourages the preservation, but it also helps people move forward into like the future of modern houses and well per and performing houses. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I wondered, you, you had the question about um, it, how it, it's difficult to accommodate energy efficiency. I was wondering if you were speaking specifically to the Eichlers 
or historic, historic homes in general? Uh, yeah, historic homes in general. Okay, so not just specific to Eichler's, because I just wondered if there's anything. Eichler's that you super could... hard, like with like windows and very poor insulation, and you know people are, don't want to do upgrades because they don't want to change the siding because they want to they don't want to get into like a planning review. Uh, so it's really difficult, right, to to upgrade these homes without really crossing that threshold where people are being required to do extensive requirements already by building, and then now also by planning. So that's sure. going to make it twice as difficult to get a permit, twice as expensive to get a permit, which is, I mean, sure. homeowners know that. But uh, um, And just to clarify, so this this one of the neighborhoods the, the, um, is already, it's already designated, it's already subject to requirements. So the intent for this is to, and I don't know if you've used the year old house guidelines you have, so is to make it clearer and you know they're standard so it's very specific whereas you know the guidelines can can be a little bit more um subject to interpretation so these should be hopefully going in in that direction that is giving you more specific guidance rather than um, the other guidelines but i'm happy to have a conversation with you maybe offline i can exchange some information with you and and we can talk about that but general um as I said in the beginning, th these um, standards are meant to follow the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation, which are federal um, standards and guidelines um, that pretty much most communities in the country use. Um, and sort of, if you look at them in terms of tiers, it's you know to maintain, kind of preserve the the character defining features, then repair them and then replace kind of only when necessary. I know windows is a really difficult topic, um, but there are lots of ways that um, windows can be made energy efficient without replacing them. And, and siding, you know, these are, you know, it's very hard to find the material, to find materials of quality yeah. and very few choices for owners. Uh, and then what, so that's, is that the benefit of being a part of the registry that you get very clear guidelines and requirements? Uh, or in general, what is the benefit? of the neighborhood turning because you said there was even other communities that aren't that might want to do this like why would a community would want to be part oh, of this um, thing? we're not really talking about designation here um i mean there's there's various benefits of taking advantage of the state historical building code or if you were an individual landmark you could apply for a mills out contract um but a lot of it has to do with predictability of um changes in your neighborhood, you know, in, in that neighborhood, whatever neighborhood you're talking about, um, because it's about accommodating changes. So we know that that's going to happen, but guiding it in a way that's sensitive to, you know, the character of that neighborhood so that you have some compatibility, even though you have new construction or additions and that type of thing. Um, that's the benefit. And, uh, you know, it, they, Historic districts tend to maintain their value. Um, they have more stability in terms of their value because when you're buying in, you know that you know that these guidelines are going to apply, and you 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 kind of know what what to expect in the future. Um, that you're not going to have a lot of teardowns and new construction in designs that may not be compatible with the character of the area. Okay, um, Kathy, did you, I'm got kind of going back around, um, did you have a, any more questions? Um, I, I have to say I share everybody's concern about the second stories. Um, not only can they see into the entire back of our homes, but many of us have atriums in the middle of our houses, which are open to the sky and which um, can uh, if if somebody had a second story behind us, they would actually be able to see into the atrium and into rooms at the front of my house, for example. So it, it's it would really be a nightmare. Um, so that's on the second the second story. Um, I'm wondering. I guess one question that I've I've run into myself. Uh, relates to the the windows in the small bedrooms on the sides of the side of the house 
um, I looked into um, retrofitting with, or, or, you know, taking out and replacing those windows with new windows that would be more energy efficient and decided not to because of the egress requirements of the city code. I'm assuming that these guidelines don't supersede anything in the safety standards of the city. Is that is that your understanding as well, Dana? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we just leave it the way it is because, you know, it's too, too much of a change. Um, and then um, these, these houses um, have very small bedrooms, storage space is kind of at a premium. And I've, I've thought many times and wondered where I could add closets. One place that occurs to me, and, and I'm wondering if there's any possibility of flexibility in these, these guidelines, not guidelines, but standards to allow moving the front wall out a couple of feet toward the front, toward the sidewalk, you know, in that direction to enable adding a closet. Closet would not, would not require a window, so it wouldn't need to change the appearance of the house on the outside. If the, if that front wall looked exactly the way it used to look, except it would be one and a half to two feet closer to the sidewalk. And as long as this, the setback requirements were still met. Um, but the way I read these, these standards currently, I don't see that that would be allowed. I think that's correct. I think the standard forbids it. Yeah. My only thought in just looking at some of the photos on the, the front, <clears throat> front of the document are the the buildings and maybe Sally, she's an architect, um, can opine, but they're very much a flush plane in the front. So that would be changing that would be changing that horizontality in the front. Um, that's just my only initial thought. Mm -hmm. So maybe move pull the garage out by the same distance to make it match, that type of thing. So it, it ended up looking exactly the same from the front. It would only be from the side that it would look different. Anyhow, I'll, I'll put together an email with some of these comments for you. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Daniel? Uh, thank you. Actually, I have two comments. One, with regard to Kathy's comment, I think as the, uh, as the standards drafted, it would not be okay. And one of the reasons it would not be okay is because your facade would now not be in the plane of all the other houses and Eichlers tend to line up. So it's not even a question of looking at your individual house. It's the net effect on the neighborhood because the positioning of the houses is part of the plan, how they sit next to each other. Um, and well, the other thing I wanted to go on record for is on this garage's ADU, I would uh, recommend section 9.1.17 just be removed or explicitly say you can't do this. And the logic in the, that section of the document doesn't really follow because if you're going to make it an ADU, it needs to have an independent entrance and it's going to need to have some windows. And the only way to really do that is to punch a hole in the garage door, which breaks the facade. So it may appear to be flexible in the standard, but it's really not a feasible option to create a junior ADU out of the garage without and have autonomous entry without destroying the facade. Side entrance, maybe? Um, noted. Yeah, it, but you have to have, you have to have air. You have to have airflow, right? And it's going to need windows and doors. And it, it doesn't seem very viable to 
to do it without wrecking the front of the house. Except that ADUs, we don't have any design review over ADUs, so there's not much we can do anyways. I think that this is just trying to provide some some guidance for people to look at in designing, but we wouldn't actually review them in planning. But I'll make sure, I don't know, yeah. we have our own, the city has its own ADO ordinance. Um, but is that... Is there a difference um, in what you would review? If the ADU is a new structure that you build in your backyard, that requires a permit. Uh, just a building permit. A building permit. But if you were to create an ADU out of a garage, you need to run electricity and water. And that does require a permit. Right. But it's all building permit, though. It's not a planning permit. So then the... That's a distinction I was not aware of. So then are these objective standards only being looked at when it's a planning permit and not a building permit? Um, so when you make some changes that trigger a building permit, a single family house permit would be required. But for ADUs, because there's state law that regulates ADUs, we are not allowed to do a discretionary review over ADUs. Same, sort of same thing with these objective design standards. We're, we're not allowed to review it. Um, so we don't have any, planning doesn't look at the design of ADUs except for, and what I was gonna say is we'll have the consultant check and make sure that this guideline section is at least in conformance with our AD, the city's ADU ordinance, because we do have general setbacks and other things that are um, objective design standards that apply um, already. But I think this, in this document, they're just trying to say, you know, on these lots, you know, maybe it would be, could be compatible if you did it this way, but it's not required. Okay, got it. That, is that clear as mud or <laughs> you look like you're- That's the distinction that I was not aware of. So I need to- Kind of process it, but it sort of it sort of makes the point moot, whether it's in the objective design standard or not. Right. It's it's just the chapter nine. It says design guidelines, so they're just guidelines. They're not standards. Mm -hmm. That's right. the reason why that's the only section like this. So it's solar panels, which we also don't have control over because of state law. Yeah. Things like that. ADUs. That's all state law regulated. All right. Um, hold on one minute. I'm going to get get the microphone from the audience. Um, I, from what I've read, it's excellent, and um, thank you for the time that was spent on this, and thank you for the contributions that you've gotten from the community. Um, with any sort of regulation, the question in my mind comes up to enforcement. You know, if uh, if there is an objective standard and somebody, you know, I, I whether it's planting in the front yard, you know, putting a fence up, putting something maybe that's less um, obtrusive, that, but but inconsistent with the standards, um, the city isn't policing this, right? You know, so is there a method? or the community to flag something if they feel like it's out of, and, and what is that, right? That's one question. And then the other one, which is far afield from that, is is there is there anything in this that aids or impedes um, Mills Act contracts you know, from happening? Um, so your first question is kind of about code enforcement. Um, we, we can really only review things that um, require a building permit, you know, and that would affect, um, so, um, you know, there, there, it, there's not a lot that we can do with that. Um, if no permit is required, it's, it is hard to, to check. Um, so for instance, if you're replacing a window, but you're not changing the opening, a building permit is not required. 
but it might be, you know, it would be under a single family house permit, but we, it, that's a difficult one that happens a lot. Um, and it's hard to enforce. So generally code enforcement doesn't have the staff to be going out. I think we now have a targeted approach where there's certain areas that uh, code enforcement is going. Um, but they they have a website where you can report, um, any potential violations on your own. Um, you can do that. Um, in terms of the Mills Act. So, so if somebody did report some, let's say somebody's really tweaked about, you know, privacy because of something that they perceive to be outside the standard. Um, so they would report that and then, then what happened? Well, the chances are that, that it would be reported and, and that it's not that it wouldn't comply with the standards. It would be that they didn't get the required building permit. So they'd have to get a permit. Yeah. And then if it was inconsistent with the standards, would they be required to take it down if they? Well, and that's difficult too, because, you know, let's say they apply for a single family house permit. And we've had this in other, um, in, a, in a conservation area. Um, and we issue a permit for, you know, the changes. They have four years to complete that work under that permit, but we can't make somebody do the work. So it's a little bit of a catch 22. So the work may have been done um, in, in violation um, and we've issued a permit to correct it, but we can't m make them correct it. So that that's the difficulty there. Um, in terms of the Mills Act, I would say that it's unlikely that um, that that could be taken advantage of w with the Eichler neighborhoods. And I don't know if Sally wants to opine, but um, I would imagine that these are more, more so maybe than in other neighborhoods about the collection than about the individual buildings. I, I, it might be difficult to have one rise, rise above to that individual significance unless maybe somebody lived there or something like that. So I, I'm not sure that that would be as applicable to these neighborhoods as maybe some others. So having standards basically doesn't have an impact to the positive of the neighborhood. Probably. I, I didn't understand the question. So um, having these objective standards in no way directly benefits or, you know. Well, it benefits in that Eichler's and modern houses are not addressed in the year old house guidelines at all. So it, you know, it's providing design advice and guidance and, you know, requirements where that's kind of non-existent at the moment. So hopefully the idea is that it's making it clearer for people what the character defining features are, um, that, that are not included in the year old house guidelines. Cause it's, it's exclusively, you know, pre-World War II houses. Okay, um, I think we will finish the presentation. Let's see. So, um, as I said, um, the comments, um, the Historic Landmarks Commission uh, will be reviewing the document on November 6th. Um, and just for people to be aware, um, the, the city has restricted um, public meetings, not community meetings, but public meetings where you have to make comment in person. So if anyone wanted to comment at the Historic Landmarks Commission meeting, you would need to attend in person. Or you could email comments um, to our uh, support staff, and there's direction on that on our Historic Landmarks Commission's and Agenda's webpage. Um, Anna, you're not sharing any slides if you thought you were. Oh, I'm not? No. Okay. Now? I can see them. Uh, okay. Yes, she's been sharing the slides. Yes. Um, so you can email uh, support staff for the Landmarks Commission, or you can come in person. It'll be in the wing rooms at City Hall. 
Uh, you can also email me comments uh, anytime. Um, just put in the heading Eichler Design Standards and my email is on the slides. Um, you can also submit comments at any time um, through November 8th. Um, the website, the QR code for the website is on the slide. Um, we showed this slide um, previously, but tonight's the community meeting, uh, Historic Landmarks Commission meeting coming up um, November 6th, and we haven't determined yet the council meeting date. Um, December meetings tend to get very, very full. They don't meet in January, so I have a feeling it probably will be February, but um, the information will be posted on the project website. Um, so any final questions? Peter, did you have a question or is your hand just left up? I didn't, I didn't have a, uh, a question. I just think it's wonderful. Everybody was able to, uh, uh, voice their opinions and their, you know, their feelings about this. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing that we're able to create this as a mid-century um, sort of uh, design project compared to this old house, because they are different. And I think it's great that we were able to differentiate this and get this going. And um, I thank everybody that's been involved and um, everybody that continues to be, and, and, and yourself as well, Dana, and your entire uh, um you know, your entire group. Well, thank you. And thanks, Sally, for all the work that you've put into it. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanted to let you know that this uh, Zoom meeting will be posted on the project website, um, as well as the any future meetings with the city council. So be sure to continue to check in on the project website. Um, and if you have any questions, you can email me anytime. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your participation and um, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.